The hoax of the century, newspapers called Clifford Irving's faked autobiography of recluse Howard Hughes. Few people have generated as much interest and wild speculation as Howard Hughes, the billionaire aviator turned hermit. He was the subject of great intrigue around the world throughout most of his life. In his later years, the mystery surrounding him intensified when he became a recluse and hid himself from the outside world. So the announcement in 1971 that Life magazine was about to publish an autobiography of Howard Hughes naturally incited a media frenzy. Hughes' autobiography was to be co-authored by Hughes and Clifford Irving, who claimed to have met secretly with Hughes more than a hundred times. The book promised a wonderful tale of money, movie stars, big business, heroic aviation feats, conspiracy theories, plus plenty of bizarre personal habits. Many authorities who read the manuscript pronounced it genuine beyond doubt, and leading handwriting experts said the signatures possessed by Irving were indeed those of Howard Hughes. One said, the chances are one in ten million that the pages are not genuine. Experts declared, it's beyond human capability to forge this mass of material. There was only one problem. Irving had never met Howard Hughes, but then neither had most other people, and that made the hoax easier. Because as long as Howard Hughes remained the silent man he was reported to be, who would ever expose the fraud? Now, a lot of people are talking about Jesus today. There are lots of new ideas and theories about him. Popular novels are promoting radical new ideas about Jesus. People are promoting their own ideas of what Jesus was like. And why not? They may picture him right. They may picture him wrong. But nobody alive today has ever seen Jesus anyway. So, as long as Jesus remains silent, how can these new ideas about Jesus be challenged? As a result, millions of people today wonder what Jesus was really like. And if they could ask God five questions, one would certainly be, who was Jesus? Was he just a mythical figure? Was there a historical Jesus at all? Was he who he claimed to be? Wouldn't you like to know? It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world, it is written, sharing hope around the globe. For nearly 2,000 years, the world has struggled with the question of the identity of Jesus of Nazareth. To some people, he's richer than Bill Gates, smarter than Einstein, nicer than Mother Teresa. He's God. To others, he's a false messiah, a con man or just another religious fanatic. Yet, 2,000 years after his death, he's still the most influential person ever, more than Plato, Henry Ford, Buddha, Moses, Muhammad, or Confucius. He has over a billion followers worldwide. His life story is the bestseller every year. His birth date divides history, BC before Christ, and AD Anno Domini, which means in the year of our Lord. His birthday is celebrated around the world every year at Christmas. He is respected by almost all religions, not just Christianity. But just who was Jesus of Nazareth? Today we want to look at that question, and joining me in the studio is my friend, Pastor Sean Boonstra. Pastor Sean, it's great to be together again to discuss important questions relating to Christianity. Well, it's great to be with you, too. You know, we've, we've hit some real doozies in the past in this series of discussions we've been having. We've talked about really big questions like, is God real? How do we know He exists? But today I'm really excited because we're going to get right down to the very heart of Christianity and ask a question that's specific to the Christian religion. We're going to talk about the person of Jesus. So let, let's get started right away. Is there any evidence that Jesus is real? I mean, any evidence at all that He even existed as a person? And the reason I ask that question is I was reading something the other day where they said, you know, Jesus, historically, a figment of people's imagination. He's as mythological as Horus of Egypt or any other religious figure, never even existed. So, let me put the question to you. Do we know that Jesus of Nazareth was a real historical person? 
Well, when we consider the evidence for Jesus' existence, we need to consider it in the same way that we would consider any other historical figure. Okay. Somebody like Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar. We need to consider these are, Jesus. These are figures everybody is absolutely certain were real. People accept that they actually existed, that they were genuine historical figures. And uh, they base that on evidence. And so when we consider the evidence for Jesus, we need to do it on the same basis. We need to look at the evidence and sum it up and evaluate it just as we would any other historical figure. Okay, well, how would we do that? What are the criteria? Well, basically, there are three areas that scholars concentrate on. Firstly, they look for written documentation from early historians. Okay. Then secondly, they want to know how that person impacts history. And finally, they look for other historical and archaeological evidence relating to that particular individual. Outside the Bible, what do we find? Well, we have writings from historians around the time of Jesus. For example, there was the Roman historian Tacitus. He was born around AD 52. So we're really close now to the we're, lifetime we're, of we're Jesus. We're very close in the first, the first century AD. Um, he was one of antiquity's greatest historians. So he was a reputable scholar and historian. Now, much of his historical writings have survived. So he's accepted as a reputable source regarding historical events. Uh, he mentioned in his records and reports that Jesus was executed at the direction of Pontius Pilate uh, when Tiberius was the emperor of the Roman Empire. The, then there are other Roman historians like Pliny and Centonius who also mention Jesus in their writings. So there are a number of reputable ancient historians from around the time of Jesus who mention him in their, in their writings, in their record. Fascinating. So we do have corroborating evidence. The Bible is not our only source. What about the source that we do have in the Bible? I mean, what do we learn? If you were to look at the Bible as a historian and the records that we do have in the New Testament and so on, what evidence is there there for the scholar to find that this is a real story? Evidence now seems to suggest that the Gospels were written in the first century. And so they were written very close to the time when the events they were recording actually took place. Now, what we need to remember is that that would mean that there would be many eyewitnesses, other eyewitnesses to those events. So if a gospel writer started filling in information that wasn't accurate, the eyewitnesses, others who saw those events firsthand would, of course, made sure that people knew that this was an inaccurate record of what actually happened. But let's say, though, that people are just along for the ride because it's very popular to be a Christian. I mean, let, let's say it was just a popular movement, and so they're all jumping on board. They're saying, yeah, this story is true. Most of the apostles, virtually all of them, with the exception of John, we know met a martyr's death. Well, you know, I've heard those, those stories. Andrew died, they say, on a cross up in the British Isles, perhaps, on an X-shaped cross. Peter was crucified, probably upside down, history tells us. Thomas went to India, was run through with a spear. It, it doesn't seem, does it, like there's much reason to talk about the death and burial and resurrection of Christ and proclaim it publicly and persuade others unless you really, truly believed it took place. Um, but you also mentioned, apart from historical writings, Historians and scholars will look at the impact a person has had. What difference did they make? Did they change the world? Is this an important enough figure that the world is a different place today? Just a very practical reference. More books have been written about Jesus Christ than any other person in history. So straight off, we have a character that is very prominent. People are interested in I'm not suggesting that all are positive in their views and all the books are positive, but there is a lot of material available on the subject of Jesus Christ. There's no getting around. He's important whether you like it or not. I think you're right. You can go into any bookstore anywhere on earth, it seems, and you can find a book about Jesus. I find it very interesting that nobody actually dislikes Jesus. They might dislike the church, they might dislike Christians, they might dislike the way Christians operate, but nobody says Jesus was a bad guy. I find that so interesting. Even people who might have an ax to grind, they still say Jesus was a great guy. That's right. 
you know, I've noticed how people want Jesus endorsement. You can travel the world, you can see different political movements, you can see different ethical movements, you can see all sorts of things, and they all want to claim Jesus somehow uh, as their own. You know, our, let's say it's a guerrilla uh, warfare in South America, or it's, um, it's the vegetarian movement somewhere. I've seen everybody try and lay claim to Jesus in his teachings. Think of some of the universities that we know so well, Harvard, mm -hmm. Yale, Princeton, Oxford, these are institutions of higher learning that were established by the followers of Christ. So not just schools, though, but also hospitals, humanitarian organizations that have been established, that have made a significant impact on our world, on our society, by people who were followers of Jesus Christ. And if somebody who's had such a profound impact just by their historical life um, is alive today, you should expect to find that it has dramatic impact on people's personal lives. Well, that is what makes the difference. That is what separates Christianity from other mainline or, or world religions. Uh, the fact that the founder of the Christian faith is alive and he makes huge differences in the personal lives of people. And there are over a billion people around the world who can testify to that. He's brought hope to their lives. He's been able to radically change their lives for the better. And that's what really makes the difference. You know, really those billion plus voices that say Jesus is alive and he makes a difference in my life, that really is good testament to the historicity of Jesus. I'm reminded of the, um, the great Christian apologist Ravi Zacharias. He told a story a while ago about Napoleon and I, I brought it along today to, to share it. Napoleon says, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I myself have founded great empires. But upon what did these creations of our genius depend? Upon force. Jesus alone founded his empire upon love, and to this very day, millions will die for him. Pastor Sean, it's that love that makes the difference. It's that love that brings the change in people's lives, whether they be drug addicts, prostitutes, criminals, their lives are turned around because Jesus loves them and brings them hope. He gives them worth. He gives them a standing in society. And that's what makes the difference. Okay, well, we've seen the impact Jesus has had on history, on the world at large, and on individuals' lives. But let's get back to a little more of the um, tangible evidence. What about archaeology? What does it tell us about Jesus? Was he real? Does the spate of the archaeologist confirm the story of Jesus or deny it? Well, there was a time when people argued strongly that Jesus was nothing more than a myth because there was no archaeological or historical evidence to support the fact that he ever existed. Well, I've actually seen that in recent years. People haven't given up that line of argument. They say, well, Jesus, he never actually existed. Nothing proves he was there. Well, in this day and age, there is plenty of evidence to support the historical Jesus. And the work of archaeologists have really strengthened the case for an historical Jesus as a real person who lived in Palestine, in the Middle East. Well, g give me some of that evidence. What tells us the story of Jesus is genuine? Well, not so long ago, a group of Italian archaeologists were excavating an amphitheater in Caesarea on the Mediterranean coast in Israel. And as they were going about their work, they discovered a monument, a stele, a stone monument with an inscription on it. And when they deciphered the inscription, to everybody's amazement, it contained the name of Pontius Pilate. Okay. Now, remember, there was a time when people said Jesus was a myth and all the people associated with him and mentioned in the Bible were also myths. But here for the first time is solid extra biblical evidence that Pontius Pilate was indeed the governor of Palestine during the time of Jesus. So there we have archaeological evidence that strongly supports the gospel record regarding Jesus. Okay, now there's one corroborating point. You got anything else? Another character associated with the story of Jesus was Caiaphas. Very central figure. High priest. Uh, very, played a very major and important role in the trial of Jesus. Well, again, people said he couldn't possibly have existed. But recently, a discovery in Peace Park on the outskirts of Jerusalem uh, has brought Caiaphas to life, as it were. What did they find? They found his ossuary or a stone bone box. Okay. In ancient times, when people died, they were placed in a burial cave 
And then when the body had decayed, they would gather the bones together and very tenderly and lovingly place them in a, in a stone box, a bone box, a stone coffin, we would say today. Well, as I mentioned recently, they found the, the burial place and the stone coffin, the oshery of the high priest Caiaphas has his name actually inscribed on the coffin. And again, this really corroborates, it strengthens the historicity of the Bible account and shows that the people mentioned in the Bible were real people, flesh and blood, just like you and I. They are historical characters. And we can with confidence read the Bible and trust it. Of all these people, more than a billion, perhaps as many as two billion people who adhere to Jesus and his teachings, the claim is certainly more grandiose than he was a great teacher or a good historical figure. They claim he's Messiah. He's Messiah. Is there proof? Is there anything to corroborate the idea that Jesus of Nazareth really was the long-awaited Messiah that the nation of Israel was looking for? There are literally hundreds of predictions concerning the Messiah that are fulfilled in the life, ministry, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, we've got our Bibles open. Why don't you show me one or two more? Turn with me to the book of Psalms. We'll go to Psalms, the 22nd chapter. 22. And uh, verse 16. Have you got it there? I sure do. Notice it says, For dogs have surrounded me. The assembly of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Oh, wow. So we are told here when it comes to the, the death of the Messiah, that his hands and his feet will be pierced. Now, this is a, a reference to crucifixion. What we need to remember is that crucifixion was not the way that the Hebrews carried out the death penalty. They used stoning. Right. So when this psalm was written, nobody was getting crucified in Israel. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And yet somehow David knows Messiah would have his hands and feet pierced. That's right. Amazing. So Jesus fulfills the ancient messianic prediction regarding the Messiah who was to come. Let's look at one of my, one of my favorites here in the book of Zechariah, the 11th chapter and verse 13. Yeah, that's one of those again, ones yeah, well, it is back of the back of the, the, the Old Testament again. But notice what it says here, also concerning the, the crucifixion of Jesus, the death of Jesus. So we're going to Zechariah. Zechariah. The 11th chapter okay. and verse 13. Okay. Let's notice what it says here. And the Lord said to me, throw, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver mm. and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Yeah, fascinating. So, reference to the amount of money, the, the, the betrayal money that would be paid for the life of Jesus. Right. Here's Judas predicted centuries in advance. Remarkable. Remarkable. 30 pieces of silver to the exact figure. The information is given. And Pastor Sean, it's this information that convinced a lot of people that Jesus was indeed the true Messiah because he met the predictions. He fulfilled all the predictions made concerning the Messiah. We've read he was born in Bethlehem. Another prophecy predicted that they would travel as a family. He would go to, to Egypt, migrate to Egypt, that they would come back and live in Nazareth. All the, the main points in Christ's life were predicted hundreds of years beforehand. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Well, we've looked at an awful lot of evidence, Pastor Gary. I mean, there's the historical evidence, the archaeological evidence, the evidence that uh, Jesus has had an impact in history. But personally for me, as I look at all of this, you know, the big question is why? Why does it matter? And one of my fi favorite Bible texts really brings it all together. Here is God in human flesh. I mean, that's what the Bible predicted would happen. God would step down from heaven to do something for the human race. And the Bible tells us why all this history is recorded. In my, one of my favorite texts, 1 John 5 and verse 13, John tells us why he's writing this stuff. He says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. 2,000 years ago, people didn't know what to do with Jesus. His enemies wanted to destroy him. But how could you destroy a man who went around healing people? 
So they put him to death because they said he claimed to be God. They were willing for him to be a healer, but not to be God. That was coming too close. They didn't want God that close to them. It was too uncomfortable. But Pilate put the question straight. What shall I do with Jesus? They had to make up their minds. They had to accept him or crucify him, one or the other. It's the same today. It isn't enough to accept him as a great teacher, a great healer, even a great figure that divides all history in two. He wants to be God. He wants to be Lord of our lives or nothing. That's a decision every person must make. Are you willing to accept and follow the real Jesus? I believe that somebody today would really like to accept Jesus as the Son of God. They would like to take their first steps in His direction and to claim everything that He's offering them. I believe, Pastor Sean, that we should pray for that person. Absolutely. Listen, if you're watching today and you have been checking out the life of Jesus and you've sensed there's something there, I'd invite you to bow your head with me right now as we pray together. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for sending him. It's obvious he's more than just a good man, more than just a philosopher, more than a religious teacher. The evidence of the Bible and history is that Jesus is the divine Son of God. And today, deep within our hearts, we want to believe it. Deep within our hearts, we reach out to this Jesus, a Jesus who can forgive our sins, who can take away our guilt, who can take away the aching void of emptiness in our heart, and who can give us new power to change our lives and make us over again. So we thank you, Lord, that you're there and we flee into your arms today to love you, to accept you into our lives. And we thank you that your promise is you will never cast us out, that you are there for us. In Jesus' name, amen.